I'm so happy that you've all joined us in this scientific event and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation so far and I'm pretty sure you will enjoy the presentations right after this. And in this session, I have a very dear friend and one of the great lecturers and researchers uh, of this time, especially in the third law field, area and implant, Dr. Shayan Baruchi is here with me from Michigan, United States. Hello, Shayan, and welcome. Hi, Omi Jan. Thank you so much for having me. It's certainly an honor and pleasure for me to be here. Um, I've always enjoyed, uh, certainly enjoyed the chance to, to lecture for my fellow Indian friends and colleagues. And it's really a true pleasure to be here and share some research and some of the things you've been doing here in the past uh, few years. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation, my friend. Well, the topic that Shoy I'm going to talk about for us is actually a very, very hot topic and interesting topic in the field of perio and implant. And one of the things that we really should stick to the principles and know the idea behind it because it really helps to improve the uh, outcome of the treatment for our patients. And the topic is the periodontal and peri implant soft tissue phenotype, its modification therapies and clinical ramification. But before we start, I would like to have Dr. Baruchi's CV for all of you, and then we go to the presentation, and at the end, we can have a little discussion on the topic. Dr. Shayan Baruchi joined the Department of Periodontics and Oral Medicine at the University of Michigan in August 2017, and has been a postdoctoral research scholar for two years prior to starting the residency program in periodontology. During this time, he has been involved in numerous research projects, ranging from human randomized clinical trial and cross-sectional studies, small and large animal models, in vitro and other translational and basic research, and more than 50 peer-reviewed publications in well-known peer-reviewed journals. He also serves as an editor of many peer-reviewed international periodontology and implant dentistry journals. He is also the recipient of several research awards for his work in the field of periodontal and peri-implant plastic procedures. His current research focuses on periodontal and peri-implant hard and soft tissue regeneration, as well as contemporary methods for the treatment of peri-implantitis and maintenance of health. With that said, Dr. Shayan, we are ready for your beautiful presentation and the platform is all yours. And we're looking forward for the discussion at the end of it. All right, thank you, Omijan. Thanks again for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, so, yes. All right, so as you very well said, uh, it's certainly a hot topic the field of periodontal and periodontal soft tissue phenotype. And it's really a pleasure for me to be able to discuss with you this topic today. This is a field that we've been doing a lot of research on. I'm very passionate about this topic and I've had the pleasure to be working with a lot of uh, certain you know, unique individuals um, to help me be able to evolve and uh, learn more about this field. And I'm gonna be sharing some of the details uh, of more uh, the background, rational science, and also the clinical aspect for you today. So. Starting with that, I want to show you cases. Uh, looking at the periodontal phenotype, we can see a lot of cases like this in our clinics these days. And here you can see the fragility of that soft tissue that you can see in the anterior incisor. There's a patient who had previous periodontal procedure done. It's a very young patient where you can see some sort of, you know, cases like this where you have abrasion, severe abrasion of the gingiva and of the mucosa of, let's say, teeth or implants. But here, for example, you can see that it's been severely abraded. On the, on the root surface, leading to a non cervical lesion in concomitancy with also the apical shift of the gingival margin. Or for example, cases like this, another consequence of severe orthodontic therapy. But when we look at implants, we can see also this case exists when we look at the phenotype of implants as well. You can see that severe or great deficiency in soft tissue, thickness or bulkiness, that quality can exist in cases like this 
or for example, like this, we can see there's even that thin soft tissue around the implants as well as uh, also an apical shift of the mucosa in that region or something like this. Now, this brings me to my topic of the phenotype. This is an aspect that has recently a certain hot topic, but it's not a new topic. So the concept behind it is not new. While some of the terminology is maybe rather, uh, rather novel, and that's primarily because of these, I think, components. One of them is that obviously we know that um, the recent, rather recent classification that occurred, um, they really highlighted the, the concept of the phenotype. And this is something that um, we talked about in terms of teeth, and it includes the, you know, when we talk about periodontal phenotype, it has a gingival phenotype, and it has also the bone morphotype. And this was highlighted in both the papers of, of Professor Kotein, Misada, as well as the recent consensus report from the World Workshop, which was both the American Academy of Periodontology and the European Federation of Periodontology. Uh, we know that the gingival phenotype, which is one of the two components of the periodontal phenotype, composed of a three-dimensional volume of soft tissue. And when you add bone morphotype, the thickness of the buccal plate, it comprises or it includes or it makes up the periodontal morphotype or phenotype. Now, um, when we say that it includes a three-dimensional volume, we know that gingival phenotype, it has both cratinized tissue width, which we all know it's measured until the mucogingival junction from the level of the margin of the gingiva, and the thickness or the horizontal dimension of that cratinized tissue, which comprises the gingival. And of course, when we, uh, as we said a while ago, when you add the bone morphotype aspect, it gives you periodontal phenotype. Now, this is a concept that was highlighted relative to the difference between a phenotype and a biotype. So a phenotype is one that um, you can modify or it has been modified, uh, whether it's due to environment or a surgical intervention. A biotype nonetheless is one that is genetically determined. So you are born with it. Now, if you modify it, you're modifying the phenotype. So I wanna make that term kind of clear. And it's something that's been highlighted in more, I would say traditional literature, you see the more the, use of the term biotype more often than the phenotype, and that's because it was a more common term. But this paper in particular, the review by Cortellini and Bisada, mentions and kind of highlights this, this critical component. So now, when we look at this uh, visual demonstration, and this is a commentary that, I, um, that was published in the Journal of Periodontology by Drs. Um, Gustavo Avila Ortiz and uh, other authors, and they have this figure that nicely demonstrates the periodontal phenotype components. As I mentioned to you, you have the cratinized tissue width, which is from the mucogenal junction up to the gingival margin. You have the thickness of that, which is the horizontal aspect of the cratinized tissue, and the thickness of the buccal plate, which gives you the bone morphotype. When we look at implants now, we have a new component, something that's also critical to implant health. And we'll get to that later. And that is the height of that soft tissue, which is called the supracrestal tissue height. So when we talk about implants, you have obviously the bone, and then you have the soft tissue aspect, which is the soft tissue phenotype of an implant, which comprises of cratinized mucosal width, mucosal thickness, which is the counterpart of gingival thickness, and then you have the other component of supracrestal tissue height. So when you compare them together, you have to notice that implants have the additional component of that height, which we know has been shown in studies that's relevant to, to the health of that, uh, of that aspect. Now, we you said, in, you know, in rather uh, summarized terms, we can use very rudimentary methods of the probe, uh, which is used more often for teeth. We can use visual probing. We can use also uh, you know, that to uh, see the thickness of the mucosa or the gingiva. And also we can use color coder probes to show us the relative. And I want to mention it's not quantitative. It doesn't give you a number, but you can see relatively if tissue per thin. And then see if you see the color or the shade of that probe, which has three. You have the white, green, and blue. And if you see that color, it will be a thin, medium, thick, or if you cannot see the color, the last color, which is blue, you have a very thick uh, tissue. 
Uh, aside from that, and this is one of the things that I personally quite like, and we have the advantage of using it, you know, in a university research uh, facility, is the utilization of the ultrasonography. This is something that we're all familiar with in medicine, but you know, it's um, being used more and more so in the field of uh, periodontics as well. This is, for example, a st study that we made actually on the humans and cadavers, and we utilized it to assess the thickness of the mucosal soft tissues. Now, aside from that, we can also see other soft tissues anywhere in the oral cavity and pr predictively measure the thickness or other components of the, of the soft tissues or even the very beginning of the buccal plate or the bone. And I'll get to why it is so important in a while. Another component that I want to realize and I want to mention to you, um, which is not actually part of the phenotype component, but it's quite important, is the level of the gingival or mucosal margin. And we know in teeth, it's called recession, which is the relative position of the gingival margin to the cemento-enamel junction. And for implants, it's called mucosal deficiency or dehiscences, which is also the relative position of the mucosal margin or the mucosal level to uh, in an implant. I'm not, not going to get into the details of this, but I just want to mention that these are also components for us to realize relative to the health of periodontal and peri-implant tissues. Now, what are the ways of modifying these components? How can we change them? How can we augment these things? Whether it's periodontal or peri-implant. There are two main approaches utilized in, in dentistry or in our fields. One is the bilaminar. From the name implies it's bi, which is two bi, laminar, two layers, which is basically you put a graft material and then you have it covered with your graft. Now that graft material can be anything. Or you apically position your flap and you have a certain area which is exposed and that you can choose to utilize a graft material for its coverage. So you intentionally expose your graft versus the bilam, which is you make sure it's covered by the flap. And I want to make a distinction because that uh, they have certain indications sometimes. Nonetheless, the material of choice relative to the graft material is sometimes quite similar. So you can use autogenous grafts, which is your connected tissue graft for the bilaminar, you do certain root coverage procedures, or you can, do, uh, you can choose to go with uh, non-autogenous grafts, which you can have allogenic, xenogenic, or other uh, tissue engineer products. Same thing for autogenous. Uh, I'm sorry, for the non-root coverage or non, let's say, or the APF-based uh, approaches. Now, this is an example of a bilaminar approach. You see here, you have a rather shallow or very small amount of cratinized tissue, and you can almost see the root through the gingival margin over here. So it's very, very thin. Here, we use a connective tissue graft, and we covered that site, and we cover it with our flap material, giving it two layers. So you have one layer is the graft, the other layer is the flap, and that's the bilaminar approach. While compared to, let's say, the apically positioning of the flap, the apically positioning flap, you suture it to the periosteum or you may leave uh, not suture. Nevertheless, the concept is that your graft is not covered by the flap material. So now, to investigate these aspects, uh, we conducted two systematic reviews to really comprehensively look at the evidence out there to make evidence-based guidelines for clinicians to use. Um, the first one I'll talk about is the usual phenotype modification, which is relative to teeth. And later on, we'll get into the implants, which it talks about peri-implant soft tissue phenotype modification. And we were trying to see what are the approaches that are used for modifying the soft tissue phenotype. And both in root coverage or bilaminar and non-root coverage or APF-based procedures. And what are the outcomes uh, relative to health and if they're maintained over time, which is very critical when patients ask us this question. Well, doctor, now you treated this and is the result going to stay or am I going to have to do this again in five years or in two years? So again, we divided the results. by a laminar, the ACAF-based approaches. If you see different types of graft materials that are commonly out there, you can see the connective kind of tissue graft, the collagen matrices, the acellular dermal matrices that are used, as well as, of course, coronal vascular flap alone 
as our obviously control. And for the APF-based techniques, we have a solidarity matrix, APF alone, which is you uh, apical equilibrium flap alone, and you do not use any graph material. And this was used back in the 80s and 90s as well. Collagen matrices, living cellular constructs, and untreated sites as control. And of course, the most traditional and the most the ones that we know, free gingival graph with the use of the endogenous uh, soft tissue. So in our results, and I'll make it uh, concise, is that for gaining tissue width, connective tissue graph is the most predictable um, graph material that we have, followed by the ACLR matrix that can also give you kind of nice tissue, while we did not find this for the utilization of the collagen matrices. And we noticed that if you have a certain level of cutinized tissue gain, it may be able to help over time in terms of stopping the progression of having future recessions. So this is very important. A lot of times we treat cases and they have relapse. This can give us a hint as to if we increase cutinized tissue width, it may be able to help us in terms of maintaining the level that we obtained at six or 12 months which is a short-term recall. Now, relative to gingival thickness, we notice that all treatments can predictably lead to an increase or significant gain in genetics, and we didn't realize that there was any relapse in the treatment. So basically, if you augment your gingival thickness, uh, utilization of any other material, your outcomes at six months or 12 months is maintained over time. So shrinkage in terms of the horizontal component um, of that early obtained results. And what's really important here is that we noticed that if you are gingival thickness, your early results in terms of increasing thickness can lead to a very significant stability of the gingival margin. So basically, the more you increase your gingival thickness, the less chance for recession over time. And we also noticed that relative to health, it can also reduce plaque index scores. And this can be speculated that patients may be able to keep their oral hygiene much better at sites that are not sensitive or they're not feeling discomfort. So this is a very important concept, the importance of thickness when we augment um, our sites. Now here, in, that's in the scope of periodontal or teeth. And another aspect that we realized was that keratinized tissue is boosted much more by connective tissue grafts rather than the gingival thickness. Because as we said, gingival thickness can be augmented by almost any graft. Well, cutinized tissue is much more difficult to obtain with your graft material than thickness. Because thickness, you can get with any graft material. Now, relative to APF-based approaches or non-root coverage-based approaches, once you apically position your flap, you can pretty much get a good amount of cutinized tissue, even with your APF alone. However, once you utilize free gingival graft, you get the most benefit of your treatment. And also, once you use a free gingival graft, you may be able to obtain a decrease in recession, even though this, as I said before, your aim here is not to gain back gingival margin. It's not any root coverage, but the ability of the autogenous graft to migrate coronally over time it's called the creeping attachment. And we know even though it's not very predictable, but it does occur quite a lot. And therefore you have a decrease in recession over time. And obviously also KT again, leads to significant reduction in plaque scores. So again, relative to health, if you increase cutinized tissue, and if you increase gingival thickness, in particular thickness of the gingiva, you get a better um, stability of your health and much more reduction in chance for future gingival recessions. And these are just the two figures that we, uh, and we also fabricated uh, for you know, interested readers if they would like to have pairwise comparisons. But I'm not gonna get into these details today. So now looking at some examples of the bilaminar approach, here for instance, you see how there is, uh, for example, here we have a gingival recession, the flap is advanced, uh, is reflected afterwards, we will use our grafting material, long story short, we uh, make sure the graft is stable. And then again, we coronally advance our flap and we have that bilayer component to cover that graft that we um, placed, secured, stable on the root surface. 
and therefore you have our results. And here we gained a good amount of keratinized tissue and thickness, which will tell me that my results are going to be stable. In other case, here is a multiple um, gingival recessions were treated. Here we used connective tissue graft for selective utilization. We didn't place the connective tissue graft all around. We only use it for selective areas that we think fit the most out of this connective tissue graft. And you see here, the results of one year, you have increased thickness exactly where I placed my connective tissue graft and also good results stable at one year. And I'm sure it'll be stable over time because I gained this thickness. Aside from the areas that we use the chronic advanced fast procedure, we know that we also know that you can utilize the tunneling procedures where we have to very minimally invasively try to uh, put our, uh, our incisions only at the level of the gingival margin, trying to spare those papillas while we use our instruments to be able to really passively elevate those areas, detach those muscle insertions from the flap, advance the, utilize our grafting material, stabilize it underneath the flap, and then utilize our sutures, which in case, and sutures for advancing and stabilizing my graft and my flap in a way that is very stable. And you can see that already underneath my flap, even though it's a tunneling procedure, for instance, here. Now, there are times that patients may not want for us to harvest a piece of their palate. Some patients are against it. Can we use other materials? Yes, we can. Here, we elevate our flap. Here, for instance, we're using a collagen matrix. We noticed a while ago that if we have a certain amount of keratinized tissue, for instance, and we want to gain only thickness, use any graph material to augment. Again, here we stabilize it on the root surface. Same sling sutures. I like to see in every papilla, I want to have at least one suture. Advance the flap, and you can see already at one month that thickness the of the harvested i'm sorry of the augmented area and we can also use as i mentioned a while ago ultrasonography for you can see that the soft tissue is very thin here while here you can already see that bulkiness of that soft tissue that huge looks on the right below image that we have over there which we can also quantify or we can also utilize volumetric measure to be able to see our soft tissue we gained over time. Here you see that we gained so much soft tissue thickness. This will tell me my results are going to be stable because I had a certain amount of keratinized tissue and I didn't need to utilize a connective tissue graph in this case. And I only wanted to gain thickness so that my results will be stable over time. And that'll give me a very good predictable thickness. And you can even see here, you could see that uh, even without using fancy technologies, even with simple probes, you can really see the difference in terms of the thickness that you gain. Now looking to APF-based procedures, here's a patient that had orthodontic therapy. You can see the, even the blood vessels, you can see how thin that gingiva is in almost all aspects. But she had a very, very, um, a lot of sensitivity, a lot of discomfort, to the point that she almost wasn't brushing the area just because she was very sensitive. I saw this in my patients, uh, in my clinic, my patients, and I told her that, you know what, I want to really increase the quality of soft tissue in these aspects, which are more sensitive and it's very painful. You can see that the first probe of those color coded probe, which is the white, and that's the most easy to see, there's no attachment. The probe invades even beyond the level of the carnized tissue, and it's just very fragile. There's no doubt that the patient here will be feeling sensitive. Again, with our APF-based approach, flat per, uh, we prepare our periosteal bed, utilize a graft material, suture it stable with compression sutures, and that's right after the procedure. And you can see one month after, and you can see in seven months. And one thing that I want to also highlight is the ability of the autogenous grafts to coronally migrate over time, which is uh, known as a phenomenon of creeping attachment. Now let's talk about implants. A lot of times we have 
certain conditions in our dental chair. If you in your chair, what would you do? How would you treat it? Would you utilize a bone graft material in this case to augment? You have to realize, do you really have that concavity, that anatomical necessity for you to be able to predictively gain uh, bone in this case? Or better question, do you always need bone in these cases? So, this is the same case. This is actually from a randomized clinical trial that we're conducting here and it was provided. And I think this case was done by my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Lorenzo Tavares. You can see, same implant before and after treatment. How do we treat it here, with bone? No, we only use soft tissue. And this brings me to my second review that we conducted on peri-implant soft tissue phenotype and how it's possible to do. So to make long story short, again, same concepts, bilateral approach, you elevate the flap, you put your grafting material underneath it, and you cover that with your flap. And by laminar approaches and implants, you can use the acellular matrix, collagen matrix, the connective tissue graft, and other materials. And here, what we noticed was that mucosal thickness, the big, biggest gain was with the autogenous tissue graft, which is the connective tissue graft, followed by the acellular matrix, which was higher than collagen matrices relative to thickness. However, rather than cratinized mucosal gain or cratinized tissue gain, there was not a lot of difference in terms of the gain that you can get in terms uh, relative to the treatment. A little bit higher for connective tissue grafts, but not significantly higher. Now, relative to the APF-based approaches, where you apically position your flap and utilize your grafting material right exactly where you need it and you use periosteal and compression sutures to firmly stabilize your graft to the site that is needed, we utilize that all treatments can provide you a very good amount of cratinized tissue gain because again, if you realize, you apically position your graft, even if you apically position five, six millimeters, it's very likely that just by positioning it at a lower level, you are going to get some scar tissue formation possibly. Is it predictable? No but it's likely to get. So even if you don't use any graft material, you will gain some cratinized tissue. But you have to realize that the biggest one and the most predictable one is your autogenous free gingival graft, which you get about four millimeters more than if you don't treat the sites or if it's not augmented among all your other materials of choice. So we talked about all these components. Now, how are they relevant to health? And I think this is a very important concept for us to think about when we talk about implants in particular, because we know that there's a high rise emergence of peri-implantitis and peri diseases. And are there really gold standard treatments? I think so. So it's for us to be able to prevent these conditions. And how can we prevent it? By gaining good quality of tissue around their implants that patients can, that patients can be able to maintain well and the site can actually benefit from it significantly. So we noticed that relative to health, connective tissue graft and collagen matrices showed much more better results in terms of marginal bone level stability. Meaning if you graft sites with your collagen matrix or connective tissue grafts, you have better stability of your marginal bone levels around the implants. And relative to APF based procedures, the APF and the graft materials reduced in lower probing depth less recession or mucosal recession, and much more lower plaque index, which is also what we found relative to teeth. How marginal bone levels, we weren't able to find uh, results because there's not randomized trials on this aspect that we were able to draw a conclusion from. This is, for example, a case that you can see a lack of soft tissue exactly in the area of the implant. Now here, how would you go about treating this implant? The patient has sensitivity, the patient has discomfort, even at times, I remember the patient was saying that just by sitting and watching TV, not even doing anything, the patient discomfort. What do you call it? Touching plaque approach. You prepare your periosteal bed, you utilize your connective tissue graft, and you suture it to the area as you need it. And that'll give you a predictable amount of cratinized tissue and thickness in the area. Another case. Again here, instead of utilizing the, the 
autogenous from the palate. Here we use tuberosity. I like tuberosity a lot because it has a very fibrous tissue. And you see exactly as we uh, predicted, you, you, you harvest your autogenous graft. And you can see a tissue that uh, is especially indicative of a very good quality uh, autogenous graft, doesn't have fatty, glandular, yellow tissues. And that's exactly what we need. And you position that exactly on the area that you need it. And I want to here highlight utilization of sutures. Feature graft approaches are very predictable for teeth, and we know this. And for implants, they're also predictable. But it's much important to securely and very well adapt to your grafting materials, in particular to implants. And that's why we tend to really gain that stability with the utilization of here. We use 6-0 polypropylene monofilament sutures because they're much less black. And the 7-0 vicryl sutures as very nice adaptation at that anchorage of that connective tissue and that uh, on the area that um, we were treating. Another case that we use to increase thickness here, we can even utilize, you open your site, you previously placed the implant, utilize your autogenous graft again, stabilize it. Here we use monofilament again, but um, five zero PTFE sutures. And you can see that your results, you have much more gain in thickness and also in cratinized tissue in the area of the implant that you exactly need it. Another case, again, second stage, a lot of times we open, we apically position our graft, our flap, and here we utilized a very small strip of uh, connective tissue graft on both sides on a, we needed to have the cratinized tissue gain right above the area of the implant. And we use the collagen matrix to suture it because that area will give us a very good amount of cranization. And we don't need to harvest a big piece of tissue every single time from the palate. And utilizing this graph from the patient's palate will significantly reduce our morbidity palate. It was per nothing. I didn't take the ibuprofens you gave me. So we don't necessarily need to always harvest a very big tissue from the patient's palate and we can reduce morbidity or patient areas that may not necessarily need to get a very big um, uh, harvested um, autogenous tissue. In other case, you can see he, that the patient has gingerware sessions, but he was okay with it. He said, you know what, this is how they know me and my family. The patient is 50 years old, 55 years old, I believe. I, I, this, is my, this is how I am. I have diastema, I have a gingerware session, I don't want to treat it, but I'm worried about the health of my implant. So yes, there was a little bit of mucosal recession here. But what did we do? We opened the site and we utilized our autogenous graft because we want to maintain that thickness, that health of the implant, sorry, that is really needed. We covered it. And we also gained some uh, coverage of the implant as well. But you can see the change in the cratinization. Or for instance, if we don't want to open the, our papillas, same tongue leg approach used for teeth, slightly modified for implants, but the same concept, utilize the areas. If you have fragile papilla you don't want to open, slide your connective tissue graft in, you suture it, and you see your results in terms of thickness. I want to go back to the initial photo here. You can see how the thickness is lacking, and my follow up predictable gain in thickness. Now, do you not think that this is going to be a much more, don't you think that this is going to have much more better robust quality of tissue? I think so. And the evidence also points at it. At times, we need to completely stay away from autogenous grafts. As we said a while ago, collagen matrices can also be used and they give you a predictable uh, thickness, good of tissues, so relative to thickness. We do it again at second stage. We utilize our grafting material on the flap. And I want to highlight also the notion that when you want to position your flap, in this case, you have to realize that you have to position eye level. Once you anticipate your closure or rather advancement of the tissues, 
uh, it has to be in a way that your grafted uh, matrix is right under nearly needed. And closure. And again, closure of that site. And you can see that the closure is very good. And I'm already having that collagen matrix underneath my flap and it's giving me a good result so far. So with that, um, I really wanna thank you. This is a nice picture of the Michigan fall. And uh, well, even though it's rather fall here, but it's a little bit um, getting cold and cold, unlike the falls of Iran, which I surely miss. Um, the fall is here a little bit colder. I do certainly hope that I could see you all here soon and I can be also there with you soon. And uh, I thank you for your time and attention and it's certainly been an honor and pleasure to have this rather small, short time, but uh, lovely time with you. Thank you very much and uh, I so hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much, Shayan John. Uh, actually, me personally, 100% enjoyed every second of your presentation and beautiful, beautiful cases. And I have to say those two articles that you mentioned that was uh, truly uh, an eye-opener, at least for so many practitioners doing implant dentistry because so many times people forget about the importance of soft tissue in dealing with implant dentistry. And that's the thing that not only help us stability, uh, to achieve the stability of the outcome long-term, but also from the comfort of the patient and aesthetic point of view. So I have a little question regarding the topic that you beautifully presented. Uh, you talked about changing the phenotype and you presented different materials. You said that connective tissue graft and also dermal matrices, all of them can be our options. And definitely, as you mentioned, connective tissue is superior to other approaches. I want to know your experience with dermal grafts in, uh, in thickening the tissue. Because, you know, in my experience, we can thicken the tissue with dermal grafts, but it's not as stable as connective tissue grafts over time. For example, if you come back in two years, in four years, you see that those cases that you've grafted size with connective tissue maybe sometimes grow more, but in the cases with dermal grafts, sometimes you lose some part of it. So what's your idea about it? Uh, thank you, Onjan. That's actually a very good question. So if, you're, if, you're, if your question is relative to teeth, I think that's what you meant, right? Relative to, to that. So uh, I didn't have quite a bit of time today to get to it, but the stability of the gingival margin is something that is, has been, I think, a hot topic recently. And actually, it's one of the topics we explored in a few of our long-term projects, and also in a systematic review we published in the Journal of Dental Research. There is always a certain relapse of the gingival margin that, um, that can be expected. And these are, they're due to certain components. I can tell you, for instance, if you treat the gingival recession and you get good results, but your patient instructed that they have to fix their traumatic toothbrush, toothbrushing habits, and the patient goes home and starts to brush vigorously and horizontally in that area, I can tell you there is a higher chance that you have relapse in the area. So, one component that's in, important about relapse is to consider the etiology of your gingival recession. So if your gingival recession, for instance, was caused by atraumatic uh, brushing habits, I think it's very important to discuss it with your patient, which is actually a very common phenomena that is relevant to, to, uh, to the relapse of soft tissues. Now, long-term relapse of ADM, we also documented it, both with the coronary mass flap approach and also with the tunneling approach, which was a paper that we published in the Journal of Clinical Periodontology. Uh, we looked at 12 years outcome after ASO dermal matrix, and we saw that there was a certain relapse. But again, one important that, was, uh, that stood out was gaining thickness and uh, carinized tissue. But again, I want to emphasize on thickness. So if you have a certain level of thickness, in that case, we saw that it was, uh, I think, 1.2 millimeters of thickness that we gained in soft tissue 
after our treatment, so let's say you do your soft tissue treatment and you gain 1.2, 1.5 millimeters in thickness, there is a much more chance that that result will stay uh, stable over time. Mm -hmm. While if it's not as thick, then certainly you're more prone to having a uh, relapse of your treatment as well. Because even if your patient goes back to some of those habits, even if the etiology is not completely removed, if you have a good certain, you know, good level of uh, gingival thickness as you need it, where you need it at the level of the margin, it's much more uh, robust and it's much less prone to having relapse as well. So I think it's the thickness that plays a big role. Obviously, you have to know that the etiology is important. Sometimes you have uh, teeth that are buckly disposition, teeth that are rotated. You may get some early good results, but will it stay? Um, frankly, I don't, don't think so. And this is, again, another um, uh, review that we, uh, a comment that we published recently in the Journal of um, Restorative Periodontics with um, Professor Zucchelli and uh, my dear friend Lorenzo and uh, Professor Corteni as well. So these are components that have to be all, you know, thought of. It's not just the mere aspect of, you know, I have a recession, I treat it. There are a lot of details that play a role. And yeah. they play a role not just in the short term, but also, you know, in the long term. So that's related to ADN. But if you really are looking for a more predictable treatment and you want it to maintain its stability the longest, your autogenous graft is really the way to go. Exactly, exactly. And um, one more thing, uh, Shoyan, regarding the peri-implant soft tissue modifications and grafting. In some cases, we see, as you beautifully showed, uh, we have recessions or exposure of the color of the abutment or the surface of the fixture. But sometimes we have also inflammation at the area. It's like perimacrositis or periimplantitis. So do you recommend thickening the tissue at the time of treatment of the inflammation around the implant or you prefer to go stage? First, doing the surgery, flap surgery, and remove all the granulation tissue, then heal, and come back and do the tissue graft again. So, I think it goes in line with my previous uh, reply, that you got to really keep the etiology in mind. If you're dealing with an implant that is infected, and it has bacteria, it has inflammation, it has... Uh, you know, all that, even if you probe it, bleeds, separation, that's, a, that's something you want to take care of first. Because if, you're, if your site is not clean, your surgery will not work. And this is a concept that even, even if you think of it traditionally, even from years ago, which is the same thing that root conditioning for teeth that a lot of people don't, may not really pay attention to, uh, was set forward. That if you want to put your graft material on a root surface, you root plane the area, you use what well, we use EDTA, for example. We use EDTA after we uh, the tooth. But the same thing on implants. You got to make sure the implant is healthy before you try to augment it. Because if it's not healthy, then it's uh, a lot of times your uh, your procedure may not work. Now, is there literature on this? Frankly, I don't know of it. That let's say they compare in a randomized trial doing an FTG and a healthy versus the implant, uh, but I personally don't think that if you can, you know, if you do a surgery in a side that is not healthy, it will give you all the good results. So I would say take care of the mucositis first, clean it. And with mucositis, I wouldn't say you need to flap the area. A lot of times with peri-implant mucositis, you can just do mechanical debridement. You can give some uh, local, uh, you know, antimicrobials and uh, of your preference. Some people even like to do laser therapy. And later on, you, once it's health, you see the patient four weeks or six weeks, and then you can do your augmentation. So I would say take care of the etiology first, clean it, try to get the area healthy, and then do your augmentation. But the augmentation is quite important if yeah. there is a lack. Yeah, if I, if I get it right, because my question definitely was, uh, I mean, directed in a way that, yes, we should completely clean the area. But my question was this, I will clean the area now, and then after cleaning, is it okay for me to do soft tissue graft at the same session or you prefer to completely follow the patient, make sure that it got healthy and then do the grafting? I think you will agree with the second part. 
completely treat the patient and yes. the patient come back in the follow-up and then we can do yes. the soft tissue back. Yes, yes, that's a great one. Yes. Thank you so much, Arne. Yes. Uh, it was truly my pleasure to be your host and I'm pretty sure all of our audience have enjoyed your comprehensive presentation on this topic. And as I said, and also you mentioned, it's one of the hottest topics of the days. And I think it, it was also from years ago, but guys like you really opened it up in a new direction. And we are really thankful for that and really looking forward to see you very soon. And thank you again. Stay healthy, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Omijan. Thank you so much. Again, um, I, I really have to say this has been a pleasure for me to, to have to give this talk. Um, certainly, I've been lucky enough to be in an environment that uh, really uh, we do a lot of research on what we like. So thank you for this opportunity for me to be able to share some of our findings. Uh, I would love to be able to have done this in person, but obviously we're in a rather uh, crazy times. So hopefully in the future, we'll all be do having these things face to face. Thank you again for having me. I, Thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was an honor. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.